And that's why the vaxxers, the anti-vaxxers include security. Uh, welcome to our workshop on fictional writing and skepticism. Uh, unfortunately, we had a couple of cancellations. Uh, Sarah and Gail could not make it this evening for two completely different reasons. Um, however, we do still have a great lineup. Uh, Gary Kim Hayes, Scott Sigler, Mike Stackpole, and Tom Merritt. And uh, I'm just going to quit yakking. I guess, Mike, you'll be kicking things off this evening? I, I will. Well, that's <laughs> this, what Derek said. This, this is what Closest I, to the center. Oh. Go for it. Jeez. All you, dude. Uh, just one thing, when we're done and it's time for Q&A, just ask people to line up behind the microphone right there <laughs> so we don't have to run around with a microphone. Anyway, thanks a lot. Mike? Right, Gary, why don't we start with you and just uh, sort of talk about, talk about your work and, and talk about how um, skepticism has informed it. I mean, what, what has being a skeptic brought to uh, the fiction that you've been, been producing? Okay. Um, <coughs> I'm Gary. Thank you. Thank you very much. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, mostly short stories, but I do have a novel at uh, Bain that's uh, gathering dust um, two, three inches so far. <laughs> and uh, I like to write a lot of different kinds of uh, fiction, um, everything from fantasy to horror to science fiction and anything that has a market that I can sell to, I'll try to write. <laughs> Um, skepticism uh, sometimes gets in the way and it's sometimes very beneficial. Um, if, if you're writing a, a, um, a good fight scene, uh, I have a martial arts background. Uh, I've been teaching martial arts for about 40 years. And uh, real fights, real fights last about four or five seconds. Uh, the, the, um, the, if you write a fight scene that has four or five seconds of fight in it, it's two, two sentences, it's over. So you have to, you have to really lie to yourself and, and make it very exciting without having a lot of really stupid stuff happen uh, and going into extreme detail of he twisted his back foot slightly and then turned at a 10 degree angle and then stared into the eyes of his opponent. Well, that's just way too slow. So it's very difficult sometimes. <laughs> Scott, what, is, what does skepticism bring to your work? Uh, it, I think I'm a horror author primarily and you don't find it in a lot of hard science and skepticism in horror fiction. It's dominated by uh, vampires and zombies the non-scientific kind of zombies, and werewolves, and ghost spirits, sprites, haunts, witches, etc. So um, trying to bring things from a rational, this could possibly happen, and here's why this could happen. Here's why this guy could turn into a raving psychopath. Here's the biology behind it. Really helps push me into, uh, it helps push me into an area that not a lot of people are in. As far as I'm just only a handful of writers that write kind of the same style of hard science horror that I write. So it helps uh, a great deal there. And as Gary mentioned, the uh, fight scenes and other things, just trying to keep everything as realistic as possible. I just spend four or five pages building up to the fight, which lasts two cents. Yeah. And then it's the drama of waiting for things to happen and then trying to keep it real. Um, at least for my work, I feel it allows the, the reader to buy into it much more fully and immerse themselves deeper into the story so that as things happen, they, they feel that much more intensely. So just trying to be as realistic as possible helps with that quite a bit. Tom? Well, yeah, I, I mostly do commentary podcasts. So that, that's my, my main line of work. I, I, I'm a recreational fiction writer. I've published a couple uh, on Lulu. I'm sort of somewhere in Scott's wake uh, as far as I've made some, some of my books into podcasts and put them out. Uh, but, but from where I sit when you're writing fiction, it's two things that skepticism allows you to do is one to me it's about facts and it's about keeping an open mind and that really allows you to write creatively because you're able to 
Yeah, you, you want to go find out what something is really like before you write about it, and that's always advantageous. And it also means that you're open to seeing things from different point of view. So when you write characters, they don't all have, they're not all one-dimensional. They all have varying points of view. But it also, especially when you write something like science fiction, it, it gives you the release of, of breaking some of those rules that you have to follow when you're dealing with real life. Uh, when you're dealing with real life, you can't believe the snake oil works, but you can give yourself that, that sort of fantasy uh, in a book, perhaps, that you can have one or two MacGuffins that break those rules and, and then try to figure out what would be the rational reactions to that uh, in the story. Yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to um, you know, where skepticism plays a big part in, in fiction is just that, that old bromide that uh, truth is stranger than fiction. Uh, in truth, we have unanswered questions. In fiction, we have to answer all of those questions. Otherwise, you know, we've cheated the reader, and they're, they're not going to like it. So that, so that even if we're dealing with, with horror and dealing with supernatural things, things that as skeptics we, we want explanations for, uh, we can throw those out because no matter what we're doing, we build a logical structure that offers some sort of an explanation. So if you will, we're using the tools of rationalism to describe the limitations of the totally irrational to actually make the, the story work. And so in, in some ways, writing fiction or writing good fiction where you're being responsible is, is one of the ultimate skeptic acts because you're training the readers to think critically because uh, that's really what fiction is. I mean, if, if, if you look at fiction as a, a big game of name that tune between the reader and the writers, you know, ultimately you have to be able to use logic to, to reach the same conclusion that the that the reader will. So we're, we're training uh, our readers in, in, uh, in, that, uh, in that particular endeavor. Now, do you guys, I want to throw this out, do, do you guys uh, ever run into situations where uh, uh, because of things you have written, uh, people will uh, question your, your skepticism or, or proclaim you a believer or uh, God help us? Have you ever gotten the email that says, you've actually hit on a hidden truth and you're, you're really writing the secret history of the world and you just don't know it yet. Uh, no. Go ahead. I, I, that really hasn't happened to me either, but I sure wish it would. That'd be kind of cool. I, well, the, the, the one book that I've, I've at least sold a few enough companies, co copies to have people read is about the breakup of the United States into separate countries. And I will, every once in a while, get somebody writing in saying, yes, exactly. That's the problem, that's the conspiracy theory I've been trying to show, that mechanism that you underlined. So I do get a little bit of that where I'm like, I'm not so sure you and I would agree on this uh, if we really got down to it. Yeah, it is very odd to have true believers tell you that the work that you're doing was actually, you're just right, coming back with racial memories from 25,000 years ago when the whatever it was and the humans fought for dominion over the earth and humans have forgotten all of this and somehow I am the one who's now remembering it, and it's so this is happening. and it's all battle tech, yeah, which is really weird, yeah. So this is this has uh, this has this has actually happened. Now, have you guys in, in in doing your stuff? Have you ever looked at a phenomena or modeled something in one of your stories on a uh, on a on a new age unexplained phenomena, and and sort of used fiction as a way to work through possible explanations, sort of. Sort of, you know, uh, rather covertly uh, done a tutorial in 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 this particular thing, whether it's UFOs or psychic powers or anything. Uh, the one thing I used was for my first uh, hardcover novel, Infected, was Morgellons disease, and mm. wrote uh, this this fictitious approach to it's kind of a a bizarro alien invasion type story, but actually explaining what the Morgellons fibers were so that people who had Morgellons disease were misfires of these infections that were populating people. So the infection went correctly, you would never see the Morgellons disease. If it went awry and sort of died in utero, that's what the actual fibers were for. Um, and it was really fun because I had no idea how many people had never heard of Morgellons disease. <laughs> and then they would read this book and they're like, your book is really scary. How did you get all that Morgellons stuff on the internet? How did you make all that happen? I'm like, no, this, I didn't do that. That's actually out there. So. <laughs> which was uh, Scott's discovery number 103, which was anything that's already got a large uh, database out on the internet, if you can work that into a book and people go out and Google it and find it, they just think you're a genius. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, holy yeah if, you, if you want to get a whole bunch of new Twitter followers, mention Tesla. 
<laughs> you just put Tesla in one of your posts, and all of a sudden, a bunch of guys will follow you. Good to know. Yeah. Good to know. Uh, <laughs> who's this Tesla guy? Yeah, well, there you go. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to write a, uh, a time travel piece and did tons and tons of research, and, of course, most of it is forget it. Time travel is just not going to work. So I, I tried to go at it a different way and, and uh, did a time travel, but using uh, the guy's mind uh, and using like um, various machines to uh, rebuild his memories and make him go back in time in his memory and things like that. And I did quite a lot of research on that and uh, mapping and all that stuff that's all the new uh, stuff that's going on in the mind today and it, it led me to down some really some remarkable things but that, I, I think that's what what skeptic it, it can do for you is is if you go and you do all the research and you find out you can't do it this way then you have to figure out well how can I do it so. right, right. Um, one of the things that I've seen in 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 skepticism and, and in, in viewing a lot of this paranormal nonsense um, is, is I get offended because I tell lies for a living, as, as we all do. And, and there are people out there that are writing these UFO books and, and, and listing them as, as true, as this is, this is truth, this is nonfiction. And, and I think that they're worse storytellers than we are. So out of, out of, the, out of all the phenomena which are out there, do you, do you have any favorites that you think, oh my God, these guys, we can do such a much better idea of making this true. I mean, you've done this with Morgallion, but I mean, are there are there other things out there that you that, that really got an appeal going? Oh man, I could really warp some minds if I were to play with this particular one. The Arantia book. Oh, okay, yeah, that was there was a somebody following Arantia that told me that BattleTech was yeah that's, their their ancient war. Yeah, it's a uh, if you've never heard of it, it's a huge volume that explains how the the kingdom of the level beyond human is actually in charge of the earth and the messengers that they send, and it's very detailed, but it, it it's dry, uh, so it's it's a it's a perfect launching point for pulling out some mythology uh, and using as 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 plot devices. So it's sort of like the Book of Mormon, but really boring. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Even more boring. <laughs> um, for the Rookie and the Starter, which are very different YA books that I describe as Star Wars meets any given Sunday meets The Godfather. So, um, yeah, but playing on the classic religious tropes. So in this book, there's an exodus from Earth. This, this guy tries to start his own religion. He gets millions of followers too violent so they kick him off so he goes to another planet starts his own religion um, and it's it's not complicated to just write a parallel religion to the ones that we have now and describe how all the followers can be completely fanatical and following along with it and it, it it's it's just interesting because if you read through it you're like okay this is exactly what we have now this is not really science fiction this is just a brand new religion that somebody made up not that anybody would ever make up a religion but um, <laughs> so, so using the the just parallels on the modern structures that we have in place, it's really easy to create highly believable fictional things that we all, that feel very real to us and we relate to. Yeah, I, uh, I think Scientology is, is pretty good, but I could, you know, I always thought I could do a much better job with Mormonism. Uh, I could come up with a, a, a much better background and, and discovery than uh, you know, sticking your head in a hat and reading the secrets out. That just always seemed kind of odd to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, always, I've always felt Atlantis mm. has got just enough distance that, that there's unverifiable stuff, and then because it supposedly had global reach, you can point at anything and say, see proof. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, there's just tons of things that you can, that you can pull out and questionable dating and, you know, and you can fudge the science and those things. And it would, be, it would be loads of fun and absolutely terrifying. And then I could start my own religion, which would be better than Scientology or Mormonism. And, and uh, you know, and then I could kick off the planet and I'd have to go elsewhere and start another religion. So, uh, yeah. Now, now, do you guys, do you, do you have any problems, do you think, in be, being skeptics? Do you find it difficult in a story to... Do justice to a character who's a who's a true believer. I don't have any problem with the true believer characters, and I give away all my stuff as all my books as unabridged free podcasts for my website. So and I've been shocked at far left, far right, atheist, hardcore Christian, the number of fans I get in because I just 
present everybody kind of as they are in the world. If you are a Bible thumper, then you're Bible thumper characters who are good and bad. If you are a skeptic, there are skeptic characters who are good and bad. So I don't really seem to have any problem, uh, problem with that either way. Well, uh, I think uh, I tend to, to make the true believers a little bit more fanatical uh, than the skeptics, of course. It's the true believer, and, and it, if you really believe something strongly enough, it becomes true for you. Right. Uh, it may not be true for everybody else, but it's true for you. And, and your reality begins to change, and, and you react differently. Uh, I knew a guy that uh, there's a, in the martial arts industry, a lot of this uh, uh, one-touch knockouts, death touch, and stuff like that. And Denmark. And uh, Denmark. And uh, it's a, most of it is all a bunch of bunk, too. And, uh, but I knew a guy that believed it so, so deeply. You know, you could go, how you doing? Oh, oh, don't do that. Don't do that because I have, now I have to do this and I have to do this. And, you know, it's like, chill out. You know, but he really believed it. And you could knock him out just by looking at him real hard. Mm. So I think true believers uh, are very dangerous. One thing I, I do that I, uh, I didn't mention earlier, I counts as fiction. I do a parody news site. I've been doing it for over 10 years. Uh, just on and off, I write fake news articles, kind of like The Onion. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things I like to revisit quite often is God having a press conference. Uh, and, and, you know, what he or she actually thinks about what's going on and what's being done in their name and, and this and that. Uh, and... I tell you, when you were talking about getting reactions from right and left, I always feel like those are some of the more risque things I put on. But I hear from religious people all the time, or see links on like Christianity sites uh, pointing back to it because they think it's hilarious. Uh, so it's kind of funny when you think you're pointing one way, how someone can reinterpret what you're doing. It People can run into trouble with it. I think it was uh, Douglas Preston's novel, Blasphemy. If it's not Douglas Preston, it's Lincoln Child. They usually write together, but wrote this book called Blasphemy, and it's about this supercomputer project that kind of taps a hole into heaven and God comes through. And um, it's, a, it's a really cool book until you get to the end, and there's just this massive wave of religious pilgrims who come to respond to this event, and they're like a zombie horde. It's like a Christian zombie horde. There's no one thinking. They're just all reacting and smashing and killing. And um, I'm a big fan of this. When I re read through the reviews on Amazon for the book, and it's just a lot of five-star reviews of people who just appreciate the story. But then, you know, there are tons of Christians being like, what's the deal? We're not all complete idiots. So, yeah, I mean, you have to try and present things at least somewhat even-handed. Yeah. Because, you know, there's good and bad in everything. So I, I just think right now I'm, I'm seem to be doing it right because I'm not. No one's accusing me of working for the other team. That's the. I think that's the definition when you've either tipped your hand or you've gone too far. As somebody said, you're one of them. They're Christians, and then then you know that okay. Well, I'm not going down the middle anymore, or presenting myself as just the. Or the if narrative. you get equal accusations from both sides. If you get equal it, yeah, ones. You should yeah. be doing pretty good. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you're probably all right. Now, do you do? But Sam Token, when you, when you have people write to you, to you have you had? I, I had this weird experience when I wrote um, *I Jedi*, which is a, a first-person novel about a guy discovering Jedi powers. You know, sort of training to become a Jedi Knight. And and I, you know, I based some of what I was doing loosely off of off of Zen Buddhism, but all I mean, very very loosely. But but I got after it came out, I, I got letters from Christians applauding my use of Christian tenets in in how I developed the the the. This, this character's approach to the force, and the same thing from Wiccans, um, and 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 it it just it it, it very much uh, surprised me. I mean, have there been? Have you seen that sort of thing that 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 people tend to map over uh, in your books their own beliefs? Well, I I wrote a story uh, that it, I thought it was very funny and. Some other people that was really funny, but uh, it tended to push buttons uh, of various groups, and I think I did a good job of insulting almost everybody. And, Always a positive. And uh, we, uh, I, it was uh, done into a radio play, and I played it for some friends of ours. My my wife's uh, roommates from college uh, ended up being gay. We who knew, and uh, she was very very. Uh, fanatical about it and when it was over with it was like dead silence and she said why would you write something like that 
why would you do that? Don't you know? And I'm like, I didn't say anything about gay people. And she was really, really upset. I mean, and I just evidently pushed all the wrong buttons, but I didn't think, it, I thought it was a joke. The only thing I've run into is uh, there's a pretty high body count in most of my books. So with a body count come victims. And <laughs> invariably, I get some kind of, uh, some kind of hate accusation leveled at me only from people that look like those particular characters who died. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and infected, it's just this, you know, there's a lot of people, there's a skinny, short, white guy who gets beat up, tortured, his hand steak knife to a wall, kind of a, you know, kind of a crucifixion thing going on. Nobody says anything about the four chapters of, of terrible things this guy goes through. Then one overweight female character gets killed, and I got all of this, why are you so misogynistic against fat ladies? Yes. I'm like, what about the skinny white guy who got tortured for like four chapters? Why aren't you complaining about him? And so that's really the only thing. So you people didn't get my to, email about that. Like, <laughs> you go. People, people tend to love, uh, love the story and what's going on until someone who resembles them gets into it, and then sometimes people take that personally, but it's right. pretty easy to fix. Yeah. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> have you have you had um, people reading in their own their own philosophy or mapping that over what what you think they they add a layer onto what it is that you wrote that you just didn't? Yeah, you know, you know what I get that I get that more often in, in the podcasting that I do in the nonfiction stuff that I do, uh, where you're using an example or or you're giving a uh, an analysis of something and they want to tell you that you're wrong, right? Um, but in the, in the fiction that I do, the response I, I usually I run into is somebody saying, well, you believe this because your character said that. Right. Uh, I've, I've run into that some. It's not, it's not so much, you know, they, they get mad because they identify with the character, but they identify me with the character. And I'm like, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm not the raving lunatic who, you know, hijacked a helicopter and, and killed two people. That's the character in the novel, and it's there for a purpose. So some people... I guess they forget it's fiction or, or that you're not writing a message from yourself. Right. And I think that's one of the things that, that really points toward, um, because people do this with fiction, uh, but I think it's also something that, that points toward why so many people find it easy to believe in a lot of this, uh, a lot of the, the, the non-rational material that we, that we address as skeptics. Just the same way when... When something in a... When something in a... In, in a story or something in a project appeals to people and reaches people on an emotional level, they stop thinking rationally. Now, this can be very positive of, oh, yes, you know, you're absolutely right. This is the way it is. I can see your, I can see your point. Or, you know, say in the stories of, story of Noah's Ark, you know, that idea that, uh, hey, they found it on this mountain in, in Turkey that may resonate with some people. You know, this could be proved to be true, and wouldn't that be cool? And, you know, what sort of archaeological finds could there be? But it appeals to them on this emotional level. And one of the things I think that we tend to forget as skeptics is that for a lot of people, and for a lot of people who are not very bright, which is unfortunately the vast majority of the population, emotions are facts. Emotions have as much weight as any scientifically proven fact. And, and we have to deal with that, and, and we as, as skeptics tend not to deal with the emotional weight and the emotional value that they give these things. And in discussing this with people, one of the things that I found to be a very effective technique is to try and shear that off. And you shear it off by asking them to think. And you ask them to, and, and the way you do that is, okay, look, just imagine if... And, and that's the same thing you would say to a child. Let's, let's, let's play, let's pretend. And using those words tend to open people up to that same receptability that we have when we're kids. You know, ultimately, everything that we do in fiction, you know, it, when you pick up a book, though the words may not be on the page, when you start reading that, the, hey, let's pretend, or just imagine if, is part and parcel of that message. And that's why we get back past that suspension of disbelief. And, and a lot of times when people are presenting all of this uh, irrational material, uh, and, and, and if, you listen to, if you listen to the practitioners presenting this, in a lot of times they will use those code words to get you to stop using your rational mind. Just stop thinking about this. You know, don't 
hold open the possibility that this is true. And, and, and people, good, earnest people, all of us, trying to be fair, trying to have an open mind, will turn off our ability uh, to think critically when we do that. Um, and it's, it's amazing watching that. For us as fiction writers, this is great. We don't want them thinking critically because let's face it, you know, um, X-wings can't make sound in space. Uh, you know, Death Stars aren't going to blow up with a halo like that. Um, you know, there's all these, all these little things that we don't want them to looking at, looking at critically. Um, and so that's one of those things that benefit us. But you also have to, as skeptics, be aware that it's out there. And that, and that the guys who are promulgating a lot of this nonsense, they're spinning their stories, albeit not as, as, as good as we do. Comments, observations, other things? Well, you can't, you can't make decisions without the emotional part of your brain working. It's a, it, that's a studied fact. You know, right. the people who have damage uh, to that emotional part of their brain become incapable of, of coming to a decision. Uh, and so your, your job, to me, is to figure out how not to let that part fool you, how to, how to, how to use that to make good decisions. Uh, and, and so when you're, when you're writing fiction, you're, you're playing towards that. You're trying to get people to give up just enough, yeah. you know, and, and so that they can accept your universe, which isn't true because you're not trying to portray it as such, but it's got enough verisimilitude that they can live in it and, and they won't back off and go, no, wait a minute, that, that would never happen. Well, and you really, I mean, as, as a writer, you want to connect with them on an emotional level which draws it into a level of reality that you, you mm -hmm. just wouldn't, you just wouldn't have otherwise. If you if you are incapable as an author of connecting with your audience on an emotional level, you're not you're going to fail as an author uh, ultimately. That's what makes the story real. If I create a character and find a way to give you some kind of emotional attachment to that character, or you relate to that character in any way, and you get that emotional reaction, for that for that split second, it stops being a fictional character, fictitious character, excuse me, and it starts becoming it's just this guy or this girl that you know. And um, if I can do that to you a couple of times in short, in, 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 uh, set up a pattern of that, and you're allowing yourself to buy into the story, it's, emotion is the tool by which you get pulled into the story and you actually give a crap what happens to this character. The second you don't realize it, but subconsciously you start caring about what happens to the character, that's when we have you. That's when like, you're, you're going to start turning pages like there's no tomorrow, and you're going to be sleepy when you go to work because you had to stay up reading the book. So it's, it's, emotion is the, the tool that I use to manipulate. Yeah. If you can hit the right buttons, uh, you can get people to give up their right to think at all. Uh, I, I think about the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry. I do a lot of research in, in that area. And uh, people have a real short memory. And, and what they've done is uh, just take the H1N1. Uh, we were told that it was just this horrible, horrible epidemic and everybody needs to go out and get their vaccination right now, uh, although we don't have enough and we're going, we're going to be short on the supply, so you must rush out right now and then, then you go to get it and they don't have it and then you get all upset and then you have to do it and, and, and then you find out later on that uh, this past season for the flu was actually the mildest we've ever had and the H1N1 was, my, I mean, usually about 35,000 people supposedly die every year and this year it was only about 15 or so, 15,000. So, but they're gearing up again and they're going to tell you again this year that you better hurry up and get that vaccination or else you will die. Uh, and I just heard that uh, Australia has, uh, has banned uh, the flu vaccine for uh, children because so many children are going into seizures and stuff uh, from the vaccine. It's not necessarily the, uh, it's the adjuvant, it's not the, uh, it's not the vaccine itself, it's what they put into it, but uh, they're having a lot of that. So they play on your emotion and, and they make you feel like if you don't do this right now, I need to not even think about it, I need to rush out and do it. And uh, that's the best way to get people to stop thinking. Aside from religion, which of which of these things do you think are the are the most damaging? I, I know, I know. For me, I, I have a because uh, my my dad's a doctor and and uh, he's a pediatrician, and we used to see people with quack cures uh, preying on on families who had children who were terminal, 
Um, you know, so I've got a, a special hate in my heart for uh, yeah. for medical quackery. What are the other What are the other areas that, that you see as as the most dangerous, or the ones that you know, if if you had the button to push to say, okay, that branch of this stuff would go away now, uh, you know, what what would be the one that you would push the button on? I'd probably psychics. I'd probably push the button on psychics. They know you're coming, though. They do. <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> why do you have to call them for an appointment? Just show up. They know you're coming. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's just, it's nothing but a big money funnel for people who are desperate for some kind of connection, some kind of information, um, something to take away the fear of what's going on, to make sense of the things that are confusing. And it's just, it's real bad, real bad. I think one of the most insidious is rhetoric. Uh, people who are purporting to deliver factual analysis and uh, in most cases, partisan uh, facts on radio, TV, so or wherever. Well, yeah, Fox News and MSNBC both. Uh, you know, it's on, it's on all sides of the aisle where, you know, it's, it's essentially saying, hey, you're one of us, so let's reinforce your beliefs rather than actually giving you any kind of helpful facts and analysis to help you make your own decision. Uh, it's, it's not as big of a target necessarily, but it's, it's really undermining the ability to come to any kind of decision uh, and, and allow science to play a part in, in what we do as, as a world, not just a nation, I think. Yeah, I gotta go with medicine uh, on both ends. Like you said, uh, you either have uh, big pharma who is making more money than God uh, and doing everything they can to get your money, and then on the other spectrum, you've got uh, people saying, well, if you just eat goji fruit, it's going to cure everything that's wrong with you. And, and like you said, you've got to have the science, unfortunately, you don't know where the science is. I mean, you, if you listen to the advertisements from Big Pharma, they tell you that their drug is going to fix you. If you, ask, if you listen to the goji fruit people, they're going to tell you theirs fix you. So you've got to really pay attention, and I think both of them need to go away. So, um, and, and right after this, we'll, we'll, we'll get to questions, but it kind of the, the, the last thing that I would um, just like to ask our panelists, what would you say to people of a skeptical bent who say to you, you know, as a skeptic, I, I don't think you're, you're bringing enough of your skepticism to what you do. I, I think you could, as a, as a powerful voice, as a popular voice, I think you could be doing more to champion the, the, the skeptical, uh, skeptical side of things. You know, what's, what's the, what's, what would be your response to that? Go ahead. Uh, my response would be my job is a storyteller. My job is to tell stories that you are going to tear through the whole book in one sitting if possible. And that's what you are paying your money for. That's the ticket to ride the ride. I, I'm a storyteller. If I can work anything else in on top of that, that's great. But I'm not a nonfiction author writing about skepticism. I'm a fiction author. So my response would be I, I've got my primary job and I work in what I can, but I'm not going to compromise what I take people's money for in order to push a particular agenda. Yeah, I think you, you end up preaching to the choir if you, if you wear it too much on your sleeve. Uh, you get a, a lot of folks who already know that they agree with you going, yeah, right on. Whereas if you just sort of dial it back uh, and don't throw out the things that are really going to drive people away who may come in on the opposite side of you, you have a better chance of leading by example and getting them to start thinking and saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, maybe what I've been thinking about this stuff has been wrong, or maybe I haven't been thinking about this stuff. Yeah, um, my job is to lie, and uh, I've got to lie in, a, in such a way that you're going to believe it. And, you know, lying about the truth is easy. Lying about fiction is really, really hard. You've got, you've got to, I mean, fiction has to make more sense than truth does. And uh, it just it would it just get too hard. Yeah, it's hard enough as it is. Yeah, yeah I mean I, I agree with everything you're saying. I I, I, I have in the, in the last year done the first of what I would like to do a, a sort of a lot more um, stories, which is the, the equivalent of uh, and especially and geared for kids. Um, you know, the sort of the equivalent of Encyclopedia Brown meets James Randi. Yeah. Um, you know, where you where you take a a a, a kid. Who is presented some of these some of these very specific cases or specific situations, and is able uh, in the course of the story, um, using rational thought and using the tools at hand, you know, to be able to point out why these claims are are incorrect, 
you know so you create these little puzzles because I think I th and the first one I, I, is up on my website. It's called the at, um, the Ghost Watch, I think, or the Adventure of the Ghost Watch, whatever. Um, but the the point is that um, I think it's possible for us, especially as we look at things uh, geared toward kids, to provide some entertainment that will also encourage kids to be smart, to follow by that example, and say, "Oh, that's how this works." I mean, all of us know, and all of us as adults, you know, we've heard. Uh, oh, UFOs, you know, this particular UFO case was this, and, and, and we know what Phil Class said it was, you know? And we can write stories where we're able to point that out or analogous things out. And, and so people will go, oh, okay, you know, got it. This is how you can break those things down. So I think that's a little something that, that we can do, whether, whether we focus just on those little tiny things or have some aspect in, in what we do. But, but generally, I think you guys are right. Our job is not to promote skepticism. If it was, we'd be being paid for that. Our job is to be entertainers. And as Scott said, if there's more that comes in on the top of that, hey, fantastic. But, uh, but if, we, if we do anything else, um, then we're just becoming spokesmen and, and shills, and that's not what people are buying our stuff for. They're, they're buying it for entertainment. So if you've got any questions, we have this microphone here, because uh, they are recording this. So if you want to come up and ask questions, you can uh, come to the microphone. Um, Otherwise, I will go into the standard um, uh, author panel type stuff of asking you guys what are you working on now and, and those sorts of things. Uh, so it'll, it'll go to PR unless you ask questions. Hurry up. Hey. 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 My friend's a writer. Uh, she's a professor. She teaches writing. She actually feels that doing the research and trying to be too specific is constricting and damaging to her. She also believes in all of the uh, psycho energy, everything, but. Every other writer I know, every writing teacher, I went to uh, arts high school, and all of our writing, they all believed all of that. And there's one, do you have a problem networking with other writers because they know you're harshing on their groove? Because <laughs> basically you are. And two, um, how would you respond to someone saying that you being too specific are, you're crushing your creativity and restricting yourself instead of keeping an open mind? Well, one of the thing, I, I agree a little bit. Um, if you if you worry about being too correct and too specific and too exact, uh, you won't ever get the book written. You have to actually get it written and then worry about all the little tiny details later, unless it's a big detail that you know the whole plot hinges on. But you know, I, I remember. I, how d just devastated I was when I found out you couldn't go faster than light. It was like, well, well what am I going to write about if you can't go faster? You know, so, but, you know, so you can't really worry about it too much. You, you want to tell a really good story. That's all. Um, you can definitely over-research, and that's a problem I ran, ran into in the early days. When you do all your research ahead of your outline, you wind up spending a lot of time researching stuff that's not going to be part of the book. And even worse, you try and cram a lot of this stuff into the book because, damn it, you did all this research and it's really cool. <laughs> and that winds up, when you get to the point where you're a professional writer, if you're burning daylight on stuff that's not going to make it onto the page, that's all not that good. Not as good as things that are going to make it onto the page. So over-researching, um, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can hurt your creativity, but I mean, once, I agree, you got, you get your outline done, at least maybe get to the first draft, then you really start to groove in, okay, now I know this is going in the book, now I'm really going to nail down and see how it works. And you may have to change how it works in the story because you were, found out you were wrong and you can't go faster than light, but it, it, it helps to get some of the research uh, later on. As far as uh, working with other people because it's going to harshen your groove, I haven't really run into that. The people I've invited to write in, in my world, um, even if they do write woo-woo and vampires and whatnot, when they, when they come into my space, they sort of accept the invitation and like, okay, we're writing in a rational universe. This is the, the constructs that Scott has built and they tend to write within that. Um, I haven't written any kind of woo or supernatural stuff yet because I just can't get my head around it. But uh, may, you know, maybe someday. So I think, I think even people from different backgrounds in fiction can all work together as long as you kind of agree what's the rule structure we're, we're working in right now. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. Nobody disagrees with write what you know. Isn't that pretty much basic first level advice? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, there, there are variations on that, but yeah. Yeah, ahead. I mean, so if you take that, I mean, all of these writing instructors probably agree with that statement. And, and I guess what I would say is researching extend, extends a little bit of what you know. 
Uh, if you only write what you know without research, it, it's going to limit. But everybody's doing research, whether they realize it or not, because they're writing from their own experience. And research just says, hey, I know a little bit more about this, so I can go into more depth, and I can go some places that I wouldn't have been able to go otherwise. Yeah, I think it, specifically to your to your two questions, you know, one, uh, working well with other authors who believe in all this nonsense. Um, look, every day in our lives, we make compromises to work with people who believe this nonsense. It's sort of like, you don't bring that out, I won't slap you down, we've got a detente. And so, so yeah, can I live with other writers that way? Sure. Do I want to, or am I going to seek them out for, you know, close consultation and those things? No, probably not. Um, the second thing, and, and this, this is something that I just hold true in general, not only for what your writer friend said, which is, if you try and be too... Uh, exact, it will destroy your creativity. Um, there's people who say, if you write too fast, it can't be good, all of these things. My response to that has always been, just because you can't do that doesn't mean it can't be done. And they have to acknowledge that maybe it's their problem, not a universal problem that I haven't acknowledged yet. If I can be very specific, and, and if I can write fast and do well, then, then that's all to the good for me. And, and they're not in a position to say anything bad about that. Nor would any of us turn around and say, well, you know, if you write slowly and if you're sloppy about not putting in details, you can't be very good because they might be very good. Um, you know, speaking in absolutes about that, about something as variable as, as writing is just total idiocy, which probably is why they believe in all this nonsense because their <laughs> IQ is a little bit lower than, you know. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> Well, I, what I'm just saying is, you know, I, I mean, I can only go on the evidence that you presented, which is very limited, and uh, yeah, but there you have it. Yeah, you just got to be, you know, if you're going to have that detente, you're going to have that detente. So. Uh, do you find yourself using current events and sort of weaving social commentary into your fiction with current events, war, or education, or poverty, or just anything? I'm using it. Um, I've got... Two, two kinds of books. I've got my modern day thrillers, which have a lot of hard science and nasty, nasty things happening to people, and then my far future, uh, mm -hmm. more fun stuff. Right. Uh, the current event stuff, yeah, I'm working, the modern stuff, I'm definitely working in current events, like uh, Infected Contagious, Ancestor Pandemic, that line has America's first Hispanic president, mm -hmm. and running that as a parallel to America's first black president, and then looking at Here's a lot of the things that an incoming president promises, which is everybody wants to hear, and then when they actually get in the hot seat and find out, well, there's, an, there's a reason things are secret, and then has to rationalize why they're secret, go back on his word, et cetera. So I'm, I do it as much as I possibly can. The next book, uh, Pandemic, is gonna feature heavily the anti-vax movement into the book, because here's this modern thing that's actually happening that's going to factor in directly into if there was a particular pathogen that was infecting large populations uh, or, or a large amount of the population, these people are building themselves up to be a victim and allow this thing to spread. So yeah, so current events can, also, can be really good for horror or thriller writing, definitely. Uh, I've got a story coming out next year in a zombie anthology. And uh, it's, you know, when, if, if you, if you're too heavy-handed uh, about it, I think it turns people off, but if you can write a story that's not really about what it's about and the underlying layer is really what it's about, I think that works better. And, and uh, this, this zombie story is really about uh, spousal abuse and, and things like that. So, you know, it just depends on, I think it depends on how you write it more than it is. And I think we all have to, we, we have, as writers who are alive today, we have to write about certain things uh, that are current in our minds. I guess, I guess my personal worry, and I'm, I'm the least experienced up here, but when you write current events in, it dates it. So it depends on the story. If your story is set in the present, perfectly acceptable, in fact, almost necessary perhaps in some ways. If you're writing a far fiction future, I don't know, Scott, if, if you back off from the current events more when you write that far off but I feel like you have to you have to see what the underlying mechanics that are making that current event work and, and adapt it otherwise it may be too transparent and, and not play even a few years down the road. Yeah, I think the other thing you have to do is you, it, if you want to do it successfully you look at the issues 
that are underlying the actual facts and you deal with those particular things. You can also deal with big issue things as, as Scott does, or, or for me sometimes, it's small little cathartic things. Um, again, in iJedi, there was uh, one particular scene where my hero was getting onto a shuttle. It was a passenger shuttle, and there was somebody trying to stuff a too big piece of luggage into the overhead <laughs> bin, which is something that drives me insane on planes. And this is merely my little cathartic take on it, and you know, and, and, and it was just, it was one of those things. But that is a universal experience that people have, and so suddenly this makes it very real of, oh my God, it's the future, and people still do this. Okay. Or the way past. Yeah. Thank Thanks. You. Uh, Michael, you mentioned that um, as fiction writers, you feel like you have to bring the reader along with you and sort of teach them to think critically to figure out your story as you go. Um, I think a lot of people associate reading nonfiction with skepticism and scientific thinking, which is true to some extent. Um, but do you think, and for you, you guys personally, um, did reading fiction as you were growing up or, and now um, influence your skepticism as much as reading nonfiction? Oh gosh, yeah. I, uh, I think that was v very fundamental in my skepticism. Uh, you know, reading Asimov and and Heinlein and all that. Uh, it, you know, in, you you start talking with with any of your friends who who didn't read science fiction or anything like that, and it's like, no, really, that that's not right. This is you know. Uh, you can't I, I can't watch movies when I see characters do stupid things because you've already been through that in all your all the fiction that you read. You know, who would who would get off of a spaceship and just open it up their their who would stick their hand in just a pool of something that you don't know what it because you've seen all of that you know and it, you just don't do it. So yeah, for me yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Biggest influence on my skepticism was when I was a little kid and I, I read the Bible cover to cover. And by the time I got through that, I'm like, there's a couple holes in the plot. <laughs> so, yeah. And that, that, was, uh, that was the biggest, uh, the first break from my culture was, okay, this doesn't line up. And then people pushing that as, this is a literal translation. Well, no, that, that doesn't work. If you've actually read it, it can't be literal, etc. So that was the biggest one. So other science fiction didn't parlay into it, because a lot of science fiction, it's not science fiction. It's not science fiction. It's fantasy with spaceships. The vast majority of it, it's fantasy with spaceships. Yeah. And they make up, it's magic, un, magic by another name, and there's really not a whole lot of actual science-y science fiction out there. So that didn't have as much an impact as uh, just, just reading some of the religious texts and saying, that doesn't quite work for me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the answer is definitely yes. Uh, some examples I could think of in addition to Heinlein and, and, and some of this actually reading the Bible, uh, too, for me. But also uh, Sherlock Holmes, Encyclopedia Brown, all those mystery uh, where, where they set up something, they're like, yeah, yeah, that, that, that was supernatural. That might have happened. And then they uncover it. You're like, oh. So I, now I'm starting to see a little bit how the world works. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think I think mysteries are really good in terms of puzzle solving and, and, and doing all of that. And and again, just getting that down to, hey, this stuff has got to make sense so that so that when you finally read some of those books uh, uh, that don't make sense, you know, if you start if you start reading about the Roswell crash, depending on which author you read, they took the bodies to California or they took them to Ohio. Well, both of those can't be true, uh, you know, and this is this causes an obvious conflict, and so, yeah. This is actually kind of related to the previous question. Uh, I was curious uh, if there are any works of fiction that you think could have benefited from uh, more skepticism that you read, or conversely, uh, might have brought too much to it to, that you thought might have taken away from the narrative in other books that you might have read. I can't really think of any, I mean, if it's a work of fiction, I just get, what's that? Yes. Yeah, if it's a work of fiction, I just kind of, I just kind of roll with it. Uh, as long as, as long as it, stray, it stays true to this, the framework it sets up for itself, you know, um, and certain, certain novelists who are amazing and sometimes, like Stephen King's an example, there's some books that are thoroughly consistent within themselves, then there's other books where a can of peanut brittle turns into a magic talisman that kills the devil, and there's no prep work or explanation or framework for that. that so those, I'm not sure they would benefit from skepticism, it would be a different story. So I don't really have anything that I would change in any of the books that I've read. Yeah, 
there's just this one story that always sticks in my mind. I wish I could believe uh, I could remember who who wrote it, but you always see the the giant spaceships. You know, all the spaceships have to be huge, huge, huge. And I was reading this story, and he had a reason for it. The uh, the spaceships used vacuum tubes. They hadn't invented. Uh, transistors yet so that's why they were so damn big is because the computers were the whole thing and I'm like there you go that's good thought right there so anyway I, I can't I, I nothing's jumping to mind necessarily although Heinlein sometimes for me I, I, I feel like you, you could have given his opposing characters a little little better of an argument yeah sometimes they get a little little easy to defeat uh, but yeah, well, it's, it does make it harder to speak. But yeah, I don't, I don't have any other examples. I, I think, I think uh, uh, Atlas Shrugged could, could uh, a healthy <laughs> dose, of, dose of skepticism. Well, editing um, too. Could go, yeah. Well, editing as well. Yeah, but, but Atlas Shrugged, yeah, could use a healthy, healthy dose of, of, of having somebody on the other side going. But wait, if we do what you say, then lots of people die and. None of the geniuses who are going to run the world want to be grave diggers, so we are screwed. Um, yeah, and so there are there are certain things I think, and I suspect if I wanted to 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 generalize from very little evidence, I think um, books and stories where the author has an axe to grind and has a message to shoot out um, uh, are ones that probably could use some balancing. Uh. Hello, um, I'm wondering how you kind of write about things that you don't understand, can't understand. I mean, it's not, you want to do research. I, I, you want to do research when you're writing, right? You want to kind of understand the, the world that people live in. But I noticed that fiction is really, like so much of what makes fiction convincing is the context of the world, right? And the context of the world comes from the writer's imagination. The writer's imagination is steeped heavily in their own life experiences, right? If the writer understands, uh, you know, internal combustion engines then they can they can add you know lifelike detail to that in the story if if it becomes available um, but like in in story circumstances if you're trying to tell a story in a world that you don't really like say you're trying to write a story about 500 years in the future and you don't really understand what that would be like and your research sort of you know leaves you with more questions and answers how do you sort of approach the problem of describing a world that you don't get or that you couldn't really fully describe or, or how, do, how do you work in principles that you don't really, that you can't really comprehend you because maybe nobody does? You don't have to explain all of it. It's yeah. probably a short answer. And you start at least with, you're starting with people and relationships. And then I have a funny, I've also got some stuff like Mike's, one of, the, one of my space elevators that lowers people up and down the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a big section that's blocked off with orange cones and it says your tax dollars at work. Nice. So there you go, yep. it's, yeah, you can, 500 years of the future, you have to assume if people change a lot, have they not changed a lot? You're kind of just writing about people in relationships. And a lot of stuff, uh, the best example right now is The Hunger Games, which is a very popular book. She does not talk at all about the culture and the society. Very, very little. She just lets your brain fill those in. She's just dealing with the characters and what they're going through. So we don't know how far in the future that is. We don't know what's going on. She just does brushstrokes. So you don't have to explain everything. Could I cl clarify that? Because what I'm kind of wondering is like, how do you fill in cultural context for things? Pardon, say again? How do you fill in the cultural context for the things that you're maybe not very good at? You know, because like the world well, that's, is big that's, and diverse. That's literally that's literally when it comes down to research. Yeah. And 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 one of the things, and Scott alluded to this earlier, um, you do as much research as you need to start writing. Yeah. But the development of the world and development of characters is a process that, while it starts before you're writing, it is a process that gains momentum and continues while you're writing. And so what you end up doing is that you identify areas that you need to understand well enough to explain to the reader. And you work on solving that problem of have I developed this enough to explain to the reader while you're going on. Characters are always going to be your anchor. No. And one of the things that writers have to, have to understand to avoid over-explaining is that, is that really with any phenomena you need to identify what is it that you actually need to know. I mean, if we take, if we take the thing which horrified Gary, the fact that you can't go faster than light, yet we know there's lots of science fiction where they postulate that you can go faster than light, you can handle that with one sentence. Mm -hmm. if, if you even need to layer this sentence in, which is, you know, in 2647, they discovered the secret of traveling faster than light. Bingo, done. What you've done is you've set a rule 
And as long as you keep that rule as a constant, or if you have any variations off that rule, you're able to explain the variations off of that rule, the reader will accept that as a given. Hmm. Uh, and so, and so that's okay. In terms of in terms of your general question, in essence, it's an impossible thing. If we realize that we can't imagine something, if we don't have the language sufficient to imagine something, there's no way we're ever going to explain it. And we may not even understand that we don't know it well enough. So we'll just sort of gear down and default into something that's far more simple that we can understand, work from something we can understand, and maybe extrapolate upwards, but only a little bit. So yeah. we don't want to push it to the point where we can't explain it. Or if we can't explain it but it needs to happen, then we state it with one of those things. With the discovery in 2742 of the 19th law of thermodynamics, you know, we, then we were able to do this. And that is something, at least in, the genre, in genre fictions, is, is generally accepted and understood. Okay. Thank you. And, and I think one other thing, you, if, if you don't understand it and you're not interested in it at all, just leave it out. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, b believe it or not, uh, Tolkien, if you read Tolkien, there is no mention of priest and, and uh, places of worship and, and right. fathers and any of that stuff. The religion is just completely out of it, although it is, you know, really a, a book about good and evil. Mm. But there is no, there's no religion in it. And the, uh, I read books and, and they, I remember thinking, boy, they went into great teeth to hell about which God was this and which God was that and the, this whole hierarchy of everything. How am I ever going to do that? Well, I just leave it out because yep. I don't really care. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, politi I'm not very political in palace intrigue and, and this king married to that. And, you know, I just don't care, so I just leave it out. No. All right. Sure. Make it interesting, but just leave it out. I'm curious, how do you find a balance and uh, create a suspension of disbelief if you're trying to base uh, science fiction on scientific fact, but then like later it turns out not to be um, plausible? And uh, the two examples I can think of is Larry Niven's uh, Ringworld, where engineering students were holding up signs saying Ringworld is unstable. and. Also, uh, in a lot of old um, science fiction, they felt Mars was heavier than uh, Earth, and so in a lot of Asimov and Heinlein, you know, the Martian walked with a spring in his step from the heavy Martian gravity. How do you create that suspension of disbelief? Well, it's similar to what you run into with using current events. Uh, you you can kind of, even though it's a far future book, you can date yourself if you put too much science or go too into detail. Going back to the last question. Um, I don't know, it kind of depends. Sometimes it depends on, again, the character's perspective. In my two far future books where there's fashion and light travel and all these other things, the main character's a quarterback and all he cares about is football. So I just don't get into it, and that way it, I can't get proven wrong later on. I think you also find in, in science fiction especially, you know, that the whole romance of the Lost Planet stories and, and uh, that kind of stuff, the, the, the things that were now that we see scientifically non-factual. Um, you have the steampunk movement where we get to return to that innocence where we're, you know, people are writing from, from characters who are Victorians so their understanding can be that flawed understanding and that becomes one of those precepts of what's going on that it's acceptable that there are those errors. So you could now, you know, Roger Zelazny wrote a rose for Ecclesiastes because he felt with, with the satellites going to Mars that once they landed, you would no longer be able to write those fanciful Mars fables. Well, now through steampunk and those things, we are able to go back and redo those, even though we know what the true science is. And that true science may inform a little bit of that, and the true, true science may inform a little bit of these things. But we're also you know, free to have fun and be fanciful, and, and, and it's OK. And everybody accepts it, because it's one of those rules. you know. Yeah, and one, one other little thing. Uh, don't ask your reader to suspend disbelief too much. One, Unnecessarily. Yeah. One big thing, and maybe a handful of little things. But you can't, you can't say, all right, we uh, discovered time travel. We discovered faster than light. We discovered uh, we know how to keep people alive forever. And we, do, you know, on and on and on. And then they'll just toss the book across the room because it just, you just can't do it. One big thing they can handle. Yeah. A couple of little things, okay. 
All right, we are down to 25 seconds, so I want to thank Gary and Scott and Tom. Sorry we don't have a chance for that last question, so, um, and thank you all for, for coming in. And, and, uh, thank you.